Boy, do I have a fun episode for you today. I have spent time going through the collection of Super Collector Marshall Fogel, and I have pulled out some of the more unusual items that you've never seen before. Items which have incredible stories behind them, memorabilia, tickets, photos, a lot of history of baseball that we're about to go through. And I'm joined today as well by Joe Orlando, the former president of PSA and currently with Heritage Auctions. And Joe is also going to lend his perspective on some of the most fascinating items in this epic collection. So get your popcorn and you're going to really enjoy this. This episode is brought to you by Heritage Auctions. Whether you're a fan of baseball, basketball, football, or hockey, Heritage Auctions has something for you with an unmatched selection of sports collectibles. Bid with confidence on everything from autographed jerseys and game-used equipment to trading cards and more. Don't miss a chance to own a piece of sports history and build your collection with Heritage Auctions today. Marshall and Joe, it's great to be back with both of you again today. We're going to have some fun today. We are going to go through some incredible items in Marshall's collection that the audience has never seen before. And and Joe, some of these you pulled out personally because you thought that they were really interesting to you. Some of these I pulled out personally because I thought they were really interesting to me. And we're about to get Marshall's perspective on all of these, which is which is pretty cool. Are you excited for this? Oh, this is this is awesome. Yeah. Are you ready for this, Marshall? I'm ready. All right. I know the audience is ready too. Joe, I'm going to have you go first. Why don't you okay. pull one of your items out? And tell us what you pulled out here, and then we're going to have Marshall give us the background on this item. So this is a signed letter okay. uh, from Babe Ruth to Christy Walsh's son. And Christy Walsh was Ruth's agent for for many years. But it's really about the content of of the letter and the message that Ruth is is delivering to Christy Walsh's son that really drew me to this letter. There, there are... Plenty of other Ruth letters out there, but it's the content of this specific one that really is special to me. So I'll I'll, I'll pass it to Marshall yeah. if you could tell us a little bit of background. So I'm going to hand it over to Marshall yeah. now. Why don't you tell us a, a little bit about this great letter? I think the best way to explain how beautiful this letter is is to read it. It's short. October 26, 1935. This is... To Christy Walsh's son. Christy Walsh was the business agent for Babe Ruth. He also did a business agent for Lou Gehrig, Eddie Rittenbacher, just to name a few. Dear Christy, your daddy has just told me that you are now a student at St. John's Military Academy. When I was a young boy, I attended St. Mary's School at Baltimore where the good brothers were very patient with me and helped me a lot toward future life. I am sure the sisters of St. John's will help you. But the main thing in life to remember is that your success and happiness in the future will depend upon your own efforts and not the money or clothes which you might receive from your parents. The most successful man that I know today were poor boys. Wishing you success and happiness, I am yours, Babe Ruth. Hmm. That's Babe Ruth's life advice right there. That's really interesting. So Babe Ruth is saying you got to work hard and you got to create your own success. To me, it's a story of how, how a parent needs to bring about your kids' chances for success, family, happiness. It's not, it's it's so emotional for, just think, see, when I look, I look behind the image of this. Here's a man, 1935, that took the time to tell us about who he really is as a man, as a person, as a parent. So it's not just a letter. It's written by somebody who who you respect. It's pretty emotional. 
if you attach who wrote it and when it was written. Yeah. And I think that's the thing about memorabilia. It's the story. Yeah. Yeah. And Joe, obviously you're now with Heritage Auctions. And I, I also want to uh, give Her Her Heritage Auctions a thank you for sponsoring this video today. Uh, they've been great to sponsor these conversations with uh, that we've been able to have here with Marshall. Um, I know you see a lot at Heritage. You guys see a lot of interesting historical pieces. You'll see other letters, you know, mm -hmm. and that type of thing. Um, if, if something like this were to go to auction, and I know Marshall's not selling it. I'm not saying <laughs> that he's going to sell it, but it probably would draw extra interest because of the content, right? Is it that That's story? Right behind some of the items that that really causes something to have kind of an oversized auction result yeah i mean marshall hit it right on the head it's it's the story it's and and to your point it's the content so there are autographs then there are autographs that come with some form of content sometimes they're handwritten letters sometimes they're typed but it's what is being said in here and 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 some collectors are drawn towards sports content where they're talking about the the game or you know, baseball or something related to sports other times it's very personal this is a very personal letter and to me it's a time capsule i mean think about this today think about one of the the greatest athletes in any of the current sports taking the time to do something like this for anyone. Like we're just in a different society. It's fast paced. You know, we text, we, we, we tweet, we do this and that, but he took the time to put this letter together. Um, and it, like Marshall said, it was, it's heartfelt and it actually has some great life advice. So, um, yeah, just imagine the most famous person, not just in baseball and sports, but arguably the world taking the time yeah. to do this. And he did it. He did it for fans. He did it for, people he knew like like Christy Walsh's son but um just an amazing uh sort of encapsulation of the person great great item to start with but we got a lot of other great items to go through as well let me grab this one here Marshall the first world series 1903 tell me tell me about what this is here it's a full ticket to game 7 and I, uh Pittsburgh playing Boston Red Sox, and uh, some people say, well, why are they called the Pirates? Historically, they would steal players from other teams, so they called them the Pirates. The Red Sox oh. is obvious. They wore red socks, so it's not hard, uh, but to find a full ticket to that game, either the guy snuck in or he didn't go. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I one of the things about this ticket and other collectibles like it, collectors love firsts, mm -hmm. whatever it is, the first you know copy of this magazine, the first ticket in a run. And so if you're thinking about putting together a run of World Series tickets, you've got to have this one. And, yeah. and so it's a it's a grail in its category. And so um, I think, again, we're wired that way as collectors. We always love the firsts of something, something that starts a beginning of a of an event and uh that's that's why this is so special yeah really really cool piece yeah thank you for sharing that do you collect a lot of other tickets marshall other world series tickets i, I have i have quite a few of them uh you know my my resource to collecting is to stay ahead of the game collect before anybody discovers it it's like the photographs that we talked about in a prior podcast. No, nobody was collecting tickets when I was collecting. I I had a, the luxury of collecting full tickets. I didn't have to deal with the stuff. So I have a lot of full tickets uh, on display at Yankee Stadium recently. It's a 1923 full ticket when the year they won the World Series in the new Yankee Stadium. So um, if we ever do a show on full tickets, Maybe we'll go to the games. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Very, very neat. Joe, you've got an interesting piece down here. I don't know <laughs> if you can lift that up we'll here see. for us to for us to see. All right. What what so, why did you choose to pick this I, out? I, I one of the things that I, I personally love, and there's so much to love in Marshall's collection, are display pieces, mm -hmm. things that, that are visual, that are sort of more three-dimensional than than other uh pieces. And there was a series of trophies in the 1920s. They're called the Spalding set. There's a set of five. Marshall has has the set, of course. There's a, a pitcher, as we see here. There's a catcher, first baseman, fielder, and 
and a, and who am I missing? A cat, did I say catcher? But fielder, first baseman, and hitter. Sorry, a batter. So there's five of them, and they just when you when you look at the craftsmanship of these trophies and you feel the weight of these things, it just brings you back to another time. And you know, these trophies aren't necessarily associated with with a famous player or a famous team. It's just it's it's more of a period piece. It it it, it really showcases the quality and time that went in the effort that went into creating these types of pieces and as a complementary piece to an existing collection i love this i i only have three of them i'm still looking for two parts of the set but i love kind of that natural patina mm -hmm. some people like it when it looks more uh, silvery um but i like when they have the natural age to them because it really gives them that vintage look and now these these things are you know 100 years old yeah. Um, but one of the things I learned from Marshall uh, when I first met him in the 1990s is most of the super collectors that I encountered at that time and before that, they focused on one thing. They were a card collector, an autograph collector, and so on and so forth. Marshall does everything. He was the first super collector that I met that, that took that attitude of buy the best quality you can afford and applied it to everything he did. And... And so when I see something like this, like this is not one of the more valuable items in Marshall's collection, but I love the visual nature of it. And the fact that, again, you walk into a room and you see it and it really grabs your attention. It's just a, a really awesome, in my opinion, just a really awesome display piece. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. It's very, very cool. Marshall, tell us about that trophy in particular. Well, the thing about the Fatima, you can polish these. And over time, it'll revert back to the way it looks right now. So uh, the problem with these is they're usually broken, mm -hmm. like the hand or a bat. So they're starting to become worth a lot more money. As memorabilia gets more discovered, people become more sophisticated. Um, I think that what, what Joe said was correct so innocent look at that yeah i looked it up this these trophies cost five dollars hmm. back in the day and that was a lot of money so to find them in good condition i have seen trophies where the guys that own it would put their own name on it <laughs> i mean it ruin it right so it's very difficult to find them where the base isn't broken or so hmm. on but i always collected i always try to collect two ways commercially and aesthetically so yeah there are things worth a lot of money that look like a truck ran over them because they may have historic value but i always collected for condition and aesthetic values and as you go through some of the other pieces that you and joe selected today i think you'll get the understanding that how important condition is um and that's the way you'll never see anything in my collection that looks bad even though but it or but it could be valuable some people don't care and i respect that but i care about condition mm -hmm. i appeal makes a big difference yeah. to you exactly you yeah. said it better than i did yeah, yeah. it's beautiful uh well speaking of condition marshall you've got a couple of uh jerseys over here that are from yesteryear, from some absolutely great players. Uh, but these are exceptional, exceptionally conditioned for vintage jerseys. Let's let's start with this one. This looks like a very famous Dodger to me. That looks like Sandy Koufax. It is Sandy Koufax. So uh, if you're gonna collect uniforms, um, you really better know what you're doing because there are a lot of copies. Michael Jordan once said, if I wore all the uniforms that are for sale that are attributed to me playing, I'd never have a chance to play. I'd have to change the uniform. So, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of Asian uh, stuff that's out there where they'll look at a picture, say, of Michael Jordan, and they'll see a spot on his jersey, and they'll copy it. The difference is the fabric is different. Mm -hmm. And so you take this jersey, first of all, uh, I always make sure these, that all the applique is original. Mm -hmm. There's no number replacements. 
he so happened to have signed this, this is 1960, that all the the uh, the cleaning tags are there. So, I uh, so there's a lot to look for. But why don't why don't you take it out and so people can see how beautiful it is? Because <laughs> it really is. Uh, uh, yeah. Those Dodger uniforms are no are pressure. Special. Yeah, no yeah. pressure. <laughs> unfold very, it. Very careful with that. Yeah, that's. Go ahead and unfold it. And turn it so they can see how see how yeah, the, yeah. blue and the it red. It feels nice actually. It's got a really nice feel to it. Show them the number on the back. Yeah, look at that. The other way has the camera. Yeah, look at that. Now see the bottom, where the laundry tag is, and everything. Look at the bottom right. Mm -hmm. That has to be all there. You might show that. You want it to. You you don't want any problems with it. Kofax six, yeah. It's got Kofax's name, yeah. Rawlings, the size forty four. Oh, and there's a signature down there, yeah. It's beautiful. That's a beautiful piece. Why Kofax? Well, this is my opinion. I look forward to what Joe thinks. I think he's the best modern day pitcher of all time. In the five years that he could play, like Yogi Barris was at a party once and a player said, I had a home run off of Yogi Bear. I mean off of Sandy Colfax. And Bear said, You're a liar. <laughs> <laughs> so there's something with Colfax, you know, when you throw a fastball, it doesn't rise. Mm -hmm. but it can appear to rise. And that's the thing about Colfax, you know, he, the, the way he would pitch, this is very difficult to hit. I mean, Willie Mays has talked about it on uh, on television. There was just something special about him. Um, you know, after his career, he, he uh, went into broadcasting with NBC, but he's pretty shy and it didn't work out. He was married to... Richard Widmark's daughter, a a Amy, and then they ended up splitting apart. Then he, he got married again and divorced, and he lived in Pennsylvania for a while. He's a hell of a golfer, like a lot of ball players. He now lives in Florida. But, you know, he's an icon in the sense that he didn't, uh, when they were playing Minnesota, he didn't want to pitch on the Jewish high holiday. Well, every rabbi in the country said, Colfax was at my temple. Now, the truth of the matter is Colfax stayed in his room. <laughs> but nonetheless, that was, uh, that. that's part of what we talked about in the other podcast. And that is, there's something Americana about the, these guys. This is a guy who's who's adopted. His real name isn't Colfax. He came from Brooklyn, didn't have anything, uh, you know, and he's part of the American history, you know, being a Jewish ball player, being the youngest player in the Hall of Fame. It's just like the letter that jo Joe loved with Babe Ruth. The character of these people is part of America that's missing now. No ball player is going to write a letter like that. Mm -hmm. It's true. You, could, you barely get him to I, stop to sign an autograph for a kid. Yeah. And true. nobody's going to look like Sandy Colfax and pitch like him and win yep. all those Cy Young Awards and, and just be part of history. Yep. So that's pretty much how I always like to tell you the story beyond the article itself mm. to appreciate why you have it. Mm. Incredible. What, did you, Joe, do you agree? Yeah, I mean, one of the things I, I, I love about this jersey specifically is that, you know, Marshall mentioned it's from 1960. And, you know, some people who aren't familiar with Koufax's career is that, you know, he, he struggled for a few years to try to find his his groove. But 60 through 66, I mean, that run is really unprecedented. And I think to Marshall's point, at his best, I'm not sure there was a better pitcher um, in baseball history mm -hmm. and that run. So that was sort of the beginning, even though he, he made his debut several years earlier, that was the beginning of when Koufax became mm -hmm. Sandy Koufax yeah. and, and, and from 60 to 66 and he reti yeah, retired at the age of 30, you could argue that his last season was, was his best. And he just walked away because of his 
uh, persistent arm troubles and just said that he'd had enough. But that run is so impressive, uh, really, by any measure. Yeah. yeah. Think, think about this. It was he and Drysdale that held out for $100,000. <laughs> and so that that's another historic change. Mm -hmm. They got it, didn't they get I yeah. think they did pretty well. How do you feel? How do you think he feels about Otani getting $700 million these days? <laughs> well, you know, I one thing about Cole, I did meet him a couple of times. The last time Joey did a show in Chicago, you know, to sign, mm -hmm. I couldn't see him because the line went outside and around the block. not And there were some heavy-duty signers there. But Colfax is that popular. You couldn't, you, he'd have to stay for two days, 48 hours to sign all the autographs that people wanted. He's very, he's well-liked and that's, that's a big deal. It's like Mantle, mm -hmm. Brooks Robinson, um, Stan Musial. These guys are yeah. Speaking of yeah. Sam Musial, this is the other jersey I pulled out from your collection, Marshall. This is uh, you know, we we go from the Dodgers, one of the most iconic uh teams of of you know throughout the years, to now the Cardinals, another team that is has an incredible history there. Why don't you pull it out? Sure. It sure makes it nicer for everybody to see what it looks like. I always think that they're so beautiful. Yeah, they're they? really beautiful. I mean, it's, they're just yeah, they're really nice pieces, pieces of artwork. I mean, they really are. Yeah, yeah. Well, Tell me about this jersey. Well, it's again, it's perfect. Doesn't have any number changes. Mm -hmm. It's what's sent down in the minor leagues. The tagging is right. It's uh, uh, all the mm -hmm. applique is original. It's in great shape. Uh, nice autograph on it that's held up well. As well, yeah. So here, so, um, Stan Musial, Stan Musial went up as a pitcher and hurt his arm, and he was going to quit. And he ended up learning to hit. He's probably a natural hitter. And he joined the Cardinals. Played 12 games the first year, and after that, played over 100 games the rest of the 22 or three years he played. The great story about Musial, and this is, this goes to the players, they may play for five different teams, about money. Frank Lane became general manager in the 50s for Augie Bush, the, the owner of Anheuser-Busch, the owner of the Cardinals. Frank Lane was known to trade everybody. He was with Detroit, White Sox. So he was going to make a deal to trade Stan Musel for the great, one of the best pitchers in baseball at the time, Robin Roberts of the Phillies. And Musel said, you know what? I quit. Now, can you imagine that today? He's he's tonight. He's batting three thirty five, three forty. He's winning the hitting awards, the silver bat, and he said, "I quit." So Musial had his agent go to Augie Augie Bush and say, "You know what? You're going to lose Stan Musial because he's going to quit." So Augie calls Frank Lane, the general manager, says, "You know who's going to quit? You are. We're not trading Stan Musial." The point being is, like Mantle, he would have quit. Gil McDougal quit when they traded him after 10 years because he wasn't going to be anything but a Yankee. Uh, so what did Joe DiMaggio say? I thank God I'm a New York Yankee or something like that because these guys cared about the team. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at Colfax, Musial, I own Joe DiMaggio, Robin Yant, Brooks Robinson, what's running through all the uniforms that I buy? They're identified with the team. Yeah, that's true. Players so, who players who are known with that team for their whole career. So you have players in the Hall of Fame, but they played for five teams. Yeah, and it's so they don't have the Americana to it. Mm. So I'm trying to give you an idea of trying to collect important iconic figures. Mm. There's someday they'll put a statue of Jeff Wilson in bronze in front of your <laughs> shop. But right now, Colfax, 
and music will have statues in front of their stadiums. You might be next. Why don't you tell us what you think of that, Joel? Yeah, I mean, I I, I want to uh, kind of add to what Marshall said about earlier about likability. So the jersey itself is obviously gorgeous and musical. His statistics are are outstanding. And if imagine if he were a Yankee, what his stuff would be mm -hmm. worth. You know, he, he was he was that good. But likability matters. And I I can recall Bob Costas, very well known. Uh, sports uh, broadcaster at the eulogy for for Stan Musial, he actually started to break down, recalling what a kind man he was and how well liked he was by everyone. That matters in collecting. Now, some some players are able to overcome that because they're so great that it doesn't matter. Yeah, they may have not been the most likable people in the world, but collectors like to collect people who are personable and likable. I mean, you know, Marshall mentioned Brooks Robinson, another group who we lost not too long ago. Another great example. The personality, the story behind the person, the player, matters. Mm -hmm. It matters to value. And, you know, Musial is so beloved, again, not just for his incredible performance on the field, but for the man he was. And so uh, just an outstanding piece. Yeah. Yeah, it's really cool. That's a great story. Joe, you've got something else over here. What What is this piece? Yeah, one of uh, a million pieces in Marshall's collection that <laughs> we all salivate over. So this is a vintage photo of Babe Ruth, but it's not just any vintage photo. Of I Babe recognize Ruth. You, you that recognize one. the image, right? And so this it's it's a famous shot uh, taken by uh, Conlon. Mm -hmm. And was used, of course, most people will recognize it from the 33 Gowdy set. Now, this this is nostalgia for me in this sense. Obviously, I wasn't around to watch Babe Ruth play or, or uh, you know, witness his career. But my first national in 1985, when it was in Anaheim, California, the first table I walk into, you know, and see, they had a Red Ruth, the 1933 Gowdy, number 149 Red Ruth, which is arguably my favorite card of all time. But just... I just remember that to me, that was one of those cards that was just unattainable. <laughs> like if someday I could own that card, uh, but it's such a classic shot. It was used for, for other uh, classic uh, cards as well, but I'll hand it over to Marshall to, to say a little bit more about it, but it's just, it's such a recognizable image. As soon as you see it, you, mm -hmm. you know. So if I take my hand and I go like that, See that from the finger up, mm -hmm. that's two of the Ruth cards in the Gowdy set. Yeah, yep. This yep. is the full body right. one. Right, right. And then you can, and then that's the face. So yeah. That, so that's how the, the, the upper body. Uh, so obviously they matted out the background, mm -hmm. but that's how they made the card. Mm -hmm. So the history of it, again, when I collected this, it was affordable. Now, if you know from our past conversations, Henry Yee and I, in 2005, wrote the book on how to authenticate photos. You couldn't give them away. Mm -hmm. But this brings out what we spoke about earlier, the importance of credibility and authentication and so on. So obviously, if this was bought in 1990, we don't know what it is. Is it real? Is it a fake? Is it four dollars, or is it what it is today? So, couple. So that's why um, it's important that we bring up the subject again of not only credibility but credibility through authentication. Yeah. So again, this is if you look at it. I try to collect again. If you look at the condition of this, mm -hmm. you'll see that. It's pleasing to look at. Mm -hmm. And there are photos that sell, you know, like it could be an iconic photo of Mantle that's on a card. They don't care if a truck ran over it. <laughs> They're going to pay a lot of money for it. That's And I don't have a problem with that, but that's not how I collect. Yeah. yeah. And so the book that you have down there that you wanted to talk about. Yeah. I, in fact, let's bring this book out here, I think Marshall. it goes along with what uh, we're talking about. So what I did here. This is your book. This is your book on uh, a photographic journey through time in so baseball. I took uh, a lot of my books, a lot of my photos, most of them, and I made a book out of them mm -hmm. uh, and uh, had it underwritten. And it's uh, 
uh, it's it's for sale. So just to give you an example. You recognize that photo? Yep, I do. That's the photo that's on the cover of the Last Boy. Right, the biography. Gene Levy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then this is Mantle, mm -hmm. high school graduation. Yeah. So uh, again, this gives you an idea as a collector uh, what's out there. And part of the reason that I did it is there's pictures in there of High Pocket Skelly, Dave Bancroft, uh, uh, some, of the, some of the players that we don't recognize as much that are in the Hall of Fame. Because Harry Heilman, there's a good example. Who knows what Harry Heilman did? You know what he did? He had 400 twice. He was babe, Ty Cobb's favorite player when Ty Cobb was the manager. Harry Heilman also uh, ended up uh, as an announcer for the Detroit Tigers. Mm. The beauty of that story is he's dying. Ty Cobb writes him a letter. He said, Harry... You need to contact some of the writers because you need to be in the Hall of Fame. When he, before he died, Ty Cobb told him he's in the Hall of Fame. He wasn't. He got in after he died. Mm. But Ty Cobb, I mean, of all people, mm. cared about him enough, knowing he's going, he won't make it, to find out he really, really got in. He told him that you're going to be in the Hall mm. of Fame. Mm. So. That tells you he said four hundred hit or twice. I also learned that the, he would only get one year contracts. So if he had four hundred, they'd only give him a contract for one more year. Mm. Now Incredible. if you hit four hundred a day, I imagine you could stay <laughs> yeah. at Joe Dorlando's house. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You get the Al Albert Pujols contract there. Yeah, it just I goes mean, on forever. I mean, <laughs> see, Harry, you hit 400. Did you ever hear the story about Madeline at the Triple Crown? He wins the Triple Crown in 56. He's getting, I don't know, what is he getting, 60 grand or some, some dumb figure? Uh, so he, go, he goes to George Weiss and he says, this is what Madeline told me. And Weiss, he says, you know, I, I, I think I need a race. I want a hundred, you know, eighty thousand or whatever it was. You know, I need a raise. I won the triple crown. And George Weiss said, "You know, Mickey, we were thinking of cutting your salary. You got to be kidding." And Mel said, "Why would you do that?" He said, "You'll never do that again." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's how it was. You'll never do that again. Yeah. <laughs> amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. So speaking of old baseball history, this piece, this is this definitely qualifies as unusual. It also is heavy. So I'm going to hold it here very carefully. This is Joe DiMaggio's handprints. Correct. Look at that. The hands of gold, as they are uh, proclaimed here, hands presented in 1995, along with a picture of Joe DiMaggio there. How, how did you come across this? <coughs> Excuse me. It was a Joe DiMaggio auction yeah. in in New York. All of it. Joe, Joe never had had one child. Uh, Joe Junior. Uh, tragically, Joe Junior ended up being a homeless person, mm. an, arca, an alcoholic. So they found him in San Francisco, and dressed him up. They wanted him to be at the funeral. Joe Jr. is a good-looking guy like his father. And then afterwards, he um, he went back to being homeless and died sh uh, shortly after j his father died. He uh, he was, Joe Jr. was married, was the son of Joe DiMaggio's first wife, Dorothy Arnold. And she was 20 years old she was an ice skating champion in Minnesota, and she ended up wanting to be an actress. So he married her, Joe did, when she was 20 years old, and that didn't last long. I, I, I get the impression Joe's not easy to be a husband because he's only married to Marilyn Monroe seven months. And uh, she ended up marrying a guy in, in Mexico or something, and nobody ever knew what happened to her. And his son, Joe Jr., went to military school. But his, Joe 
wasn't good to him. He didn't look like Joe. He was a little bit stocky as a kid. But nonetheless, everybody died. And the estate was left to Joe's nieces. And that's when they had the Joe DiMaggio auction in New York. That was one of the pieces that I bought. It's a neat one. It's uh, just something different. You don't see an oddball piece, right? To have his handprints like that, but it's a really neat display piece. So what, what the story behind that is when you collect, open up your mind a little bit. You know, yeah. there's more to baseball and sports than cards. Mm -hmm. You know, don't be intimidated to look for memorabilia. People have a lot of fun with that. Mm -hmm. You know, they put their hands in yeah. it. And so I think what I would, you know what I think the future is going to be in auction company? You're going to have, say you have a 41 play ball of DiMaggio. They're going to, they're going to lot, make a lot. The card, the bat, and some memorabilia. So I, I think auction houses are going to wise up and make uh, collages. Like you can buy a lot that has five or six different pieces in it. Now, how expensive of that is? Well, you like Heritage has a platinum auction or some of these other auction houses. If they're smart. If you like Mike Trout, put his card in, his bat, his, his uniform, make a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's people that can afford it. Yeah, absolutely. So that, that's why I think this piece sends a message that mm -hmm. you, you should open up your mind and learn about how to do that. And I think auction houses need to start thinking about making lots out of more memorabilia and cards than just one at a time. What All do you right. think? Yeah. I mean, as far as this, this piece is concerned, this is, to me, it's a, it's a perfect example of something that uh, maybe it was true for you, Marshall, um, that it, it wasn't necessarily on your list. You know, no, no one was thinking going into the auction. I, you know what I'm looking for? I'm looking for, some Joe DiMaggio handprints, you know, but when you see it, 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 it sort of elicits a visceral reaction. And, and to your point, when you have that, if you had that on a table or on a display, what do people want to do? They immediately want to go up and put their hands on it. That it, it almost makes the collectible interactive yeah. in that way. And so how do you put a value on something like that? And, and, and again, Marshall said it perfectly about opening your mind up. I, I know that's what he did for me 30 years ago, practically, when I, when I first encountered Marshall and got to know him. It, there, are, there are collectibles out there that can complement a card collection, an autograph collection, a game-worn collection that you would never think of owning. But when you see it, you sort of know it when you see it. You know you want to own it when you see it. That's, that's just a perfect example. Of yeah. I agree. It's the, probably the most interactive item in your collection, which is which is pretty cool. I, I, I'm i sure it's a crowd pleaser. <laughs> uh, this might be the last item you picked out, Joe. This one is, uh, this is a unique photo. Here, take this and tell me what... I might take it home with me. No, why did you choose that? So the very first time I had the uh, privilege of, of coming here and, and seeing Marshall's collection on display... I walked into this room and my eyes went straight to this photo on the wall. Okay. And, and sometimes you can't explain why you have that reaction. I, I liken it to, to someone walking into an art gallery and there are just certain paintings that just draw your eye. It's, it's almost more emotional than, than analytical. And so for me, I, look, yes, it's Josh Gibson, one of the, the greatest baseball players of all time and, and a Negro League superstar who never had the opportunity to showcase his skills at the major league level and has sort of a tragic story. But there's an artistic quality about this. A, Marshall talked about condition mm -hmm. earlier. I mean, this, this photo, the condition is outstanding and the image is crystal clear. Mm -hmm. And there's something about the pose there's something about it when you see it on a wall from across the room it just draws your eye and i mean i again it was the first thing i mean with all these <laughs> incredible relics in this room my eyes went straight to the spot on the wall when i came back this time around it was in the same spot i looked that was the first thing i looked for it's just an incredible piece all the way around and i love the fact that it's larger than most vintage photos from the period. It just gives it that extra eye appeal that we've discussed uh, on the program. But I'll stop uh, yammering on and let Marshall chime in here. I mean, tell us about the, the background let of this photo. Let me ask you, do you think that photographers laying on the ground 
looking up at Josh Gibson. I've always wondered, what do you guys think? I think probably so, yeah. yeah. I think that's probably the angle it was taken at. So, the reason I say that is, do you know the famous photograph after the war ended in World War II where the nurse is kissing the sailor? Mm -hmm. Sure. That's who took this photo, Eisenstadt. Really? Yeah, and the reason I know that, if you'll, is that what I do with the photos is I'll frame them and let's see. So it's just wow, I got a lot of stuff. So <laughs> what this is is this is a, a real great article about Josh Gibson. Mm -hmm. So that they, now you can see, I, I think the story of him mm -hmm. should go with the photo. So I cut this out of a magazine. So this, if you look at this, here's Eisenstadt's name mm -hmm. on the back of the photo. Well, gee, this isn't a photo taken by Joe Orlando. This is taken mm -hmm. by, you mm -hmm. know, one of the best photographers, in the, you know, in, in his time period. So I'm not looking at, monetary value but artistic value and that's what joe is trying to say it's not only an artistic photo the aesthetic quality is over the top but the guy that took it yeah. so it has everything yeah it has a story josh gibson was considered uh, along with jackie robinson to be the first black player in baseball because he was the Babe Ruth of the Negro Leagues. And they chose Jackie Robinson because they didn't think Josh could control his temper. And Josh Gibson ended up uh, with mental problems and died very young. Hmm. So Branch Rickey made a right choice mm -hmm. not to take away the greatness of Josh Gibson and his importance, again, in American history. We keep going back to the same thing about why that era up until the, say, the steroid problem where people concentrate on the American pastime, yeah. which is baseball. Yeah. It's a fascinating story. Well, the last piece that I picked out, our final piece today, Marshall, I've got a couple of different sets of pins, and these are, these are unique. These I know there's pin collectors out there. You don't see... Uh, you don't see these very often anymore. And these all seem to be from a very uh, important period of time in baseball history. Talk to me about what we have here. Well, this butterfly case and the one you're holding are kind of a story together. Mm -hmm. So what you have here is... Ruth, Maris, Garrick, Mantle. Now, that pretty much tells you almost 75% of the New York Yankees that we remember. So these pins, if you look at them, they're rare. They're three and a half inches, these, the ones I'm holding here. So if you look at them closely, you'll see there is no toning on them. In other words, uh, some of these pins over time, because of humidity, develop emotion, emotion um, uh, like a toning mm -hmm. uh, because of humidity. Uh, so it's not easy to find them in this condition. On these ribbons and bats, there's a guy calls me up. This is a great story. He said, you, I know who you are, and we became friends. I found a box in a warehouse. Somebody actually gave me a box of these ribbons and bats from the period of the 40s and 30s and 50s. So these ribbons I are from the box in a warehouse somewhere in Pennsylvania that are the same time period. So you can see how that adds to the aesthetic beauty of these pins. Now, on the second box, 
I would say this big pin is around, mm -hmm. but it's also usually toned pretty bad and has emulsion in it. Staining is what maybe makes sense. So these big, all these pins are pretty valuable. Now, what about these two pins? This is when it says 60 and 61, 60 and 61. In my view of it is everybody wanted Mantle to beat Babe Ruth's record, and nobody wanted Roger Maris to break his record. So what happened was, this is the way I see it, they made this pin of Mantle. Mm -hmm. Then Mantle ends up hurting himself for getting sick. I think he got sick and went to the hospital. He's at 54 home runs. And and so that screw, screwed it up for him. He might have hit 60, but he lost, I don't know, over a dozen games. So now it looks like Maris has got a shot. So I think this pin was made subsequently because it looks like he's going to either made it but when he hit the 60 home run, but I don't think they were made at the same time because there's no way there's a there's more of these not that there's a lot but this is really rare mm -hmm. so most of the people i've talked to would say that this is probably made close to the time he had 61 home mm -hmm. runs these are as a group are very difficult as far as all of these are concerned again when you look at it it's a story and uh you know even even though Roger Maris got traded, he was MVP. He went to St. Louis and won MVP again. Do I think he should be in the Hall of Fame? Yeah, absolutely. It's ridiculous. I mean, if they're going to let Fred McGriff in and some of these guys, not that they're not good, but Mar Maris is also an historic figure. Mm -hmm. a historic figure. So that's that, and then... One more, one final, one final piece that I can't bring over here because of its size, but you have some incredible photography. We've already seen a couple of the, the photos that we could bring over here, but then you've also got some incredible panoramics, some very large format photos. And this one stood out to me in particular. This is from 1917, the world series in 1917, uh, what strikes you about this photo? Why did you want to add this one to your collection, Marshall? Sure. Be the left fielder? Yes. Joe Jackson, 1917 World okay. Series. So you got Shoeless Joe Jackson there on the field. Right. Patrolling the left field grounds. And then that's a picture of the team in 1917. Now, what do you see when you look at the fans? Well, first thing that strikes me is everyone's very dressed up. You've got everyone in suits and top hats. They look very, very proper. Not exactly how people go to any sporting event these days. You don't see a lot of women there either, do you? It's true. And they're That's all, true. and you know what the humidity in Chicago is at that time? Pretty bad. Yeah. Now look at the, see the light coming through in, in like mm -hmm. a triangle? Almost looks a little bit heavenly how the light's coming through on that photo. So, you get sort of an emotional appeal when you look at it. It's period. The fans you dress up to go to a ball game. It's a men's sport. The light coming in. Joe Jackson's on the field. It's a beautiful photo. So the aesthetics of it, the history of it, the American dream. Nobody's going to go to a ball game like we do today, you know, with shorts on and T-shirts. and. I mean, it, this was, uh, this this is America. Yeah. And the aesthetics of the photo, in my opinion, is just spectacular. And look at the condition. Yeah, once again, incredible eye appeal, where, where incredibly is, high condition. Who in the world would store this 1917? How did it survive? You know, usually it's rolled up, cinematic, the rats eat it. I mean, how, how does this stuff make it? Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen that before? Not a photo that nice, no. No, even the photo itself. No, I've never no, seen it. Not, not other than in your collection. Who bought, who bought, see it's signed, at the, see it's the name of the photo company? Mm -hmm. Why would anybody buy it? 
Where would you put it? You know, I'm always thinking about yeah. stuff like that. Why would you be able to take that home and put it on over your fireplace? What do you do with it? Maybe somebody who really loves baseball. Well, you, bought, you found a spot yeah. for it now, right? So why do I say all that? Because how do you find something in that condition that survived over a hundred years? Mm -hmm. That's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And you know what? The rest of them were probably destroyed. Yeah. Or not purchased. Yeah. Or yeah. if they're out there, we might find them soon at a heritage auctions auction. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Hopefully. Well, you know, one of the things Marshall has brought up uh, again and again, and I think it's so important to drive home, is now that the levels have increased for vintage photos and cards and jerseys, mm -hmm. all of the cool things that we've looked at here today. I mean, Marshall's right. Like, if you're going to spend a hundred thousand or five hundred thousand or a million dollars on anything, I know it sounds silly to to sort of state out loud, but you want it to look nice. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, rarity plays into it, like Marshall said. But at the end of the day, you want to love what you're looking at. There's that, because that and 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 to Marshall's point on on so many of the things we've looked at, but in, in particular this this wonderful 1917 image. I mean. There's an artistic quality coupled with the condition that, again, it's hard to quantify what that means and and how it makes you feel when you see it. And and but you can't um, you can't overstate that. It's important. And and another thing too, look at the way this is a lesson for for all of us collectors. And Marshall was doing this. He had the foresight to do it many years ago. Collecting is not just about buying stuff. It's about managing your collection, storing it, preserving it, displaying it. I mean, Marshall's entire collection, and of course, there's way too many pieces to get to on the program today, but the care that Marshall has has taken to to display it, preserve it, that's why he can tell the whole story yeah. about these pins, where it's great to own any of the individual pins by themselves, but part of the collecting experience is bringing like items together to tell a story and that's that's a I, I think a, a valuable lesson for collectors. That's part of the fun is going out and assembling pieces that complement one another. It makes it makes the overall experience more fun. Yeah, I agree. And Marshall, you you always do an incredible job of telling the stories, finding the unusual pieces, putting them together, and then especially telling the stories. It's always a uh, always a treasure to get you to to get to hear you talk about your collection. Well, it's really great to be here with two great legends. That I think I'm a legend in my own mind, <laughs> but you guys, you know, it's an honor. I'm just kidding, but it's really an honor, you know. I think this, this, these podcasts with Joe and you and me are real important. Uh, there's a lot to be learned, and I think anybody that watches it should watch it more than once because there's so much to learn from the experience that the three of us have brought forth for the public to enjoy. Yeah. Thank you for everything. Well, we really appreciate you showcasing your collection, Marshall. I know it's, uh, it means a lot to Joe and I that you share your collection with the world so freely and openly. And I know it means a lot to all of our viewers out there as well. So thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to everybody watching today. And of course, I wanted to remind you that you can get the full videos uh, from these shows on the Jeff Wilson Show channel on uh, YouTube. And then of course, you can also get the full audio versions on both Spotify and on a Apple Podcasts. So make sure you are subscribed everywhere. Uh, we appreciate it. Thank you, gentlemen. And uh, we'll see you soon for our next episode. Take care.